Um, in the most basic form, um, questions uh, kind of fall into a few different buckets. You got who, you have what, you have where, when, why, and how. These are essentially the building blocks of journalism. And it's how people find out the information that, uh, that is needed to, uh, to inform people and to be informed. So we ask questions of others to get answers, um, but sometimes we need to reflect on them ourselves. Uh, and so we ask questions of ourselves to better understand and better empathize with other people. So as, as I talk through this presentation today, I'm hoping that all of you will kind of think about um, how you can ask questions about other people uh, to learn more about where they're coming from and so that you can empathize more with them. As designers, we're all trying to better understand our clients and our project partners and the people that we collaborate with. And so the more that you can understand where somebody else is coming from, why they've made a decision, uh, the better you're gonna be able to make your designs. So uh, starting with who, who am I? Um, I'm Nico Raditz. Uh, that's a very simple answer, just my name, but there's a lot of varieties of answers that I could answer to that. I'm a husband, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a lifelong vegetarian, uh, and I'm a cat lover. Uh, that's Eames and Dito. If they interrupt the presentation today, I'm sorry, but hopefully they'll be nice and quiet. Uh, I'm a graphic designer. I'm an associate partner at GHD Partners. And so that brings us to our second question. What is it that I do? Um, I do graphic design, but in general, I do design as Wesley said in my introduction, I do believe that a good designer can design anything. It's all about having the right context and understanding what the purpose of the project is so you can come to the best solution for your clients. Um, I also run a business. Um, so I try to apply the design principles that I've learned throughout my education and through my career to, uh, to our business practices so that we can run a successful design firm. Um, I said graphic design, but more specifically, I uh, do environmental graphic design. So anything that requires graphics and signage in the built environment. Um, I attend meetings. I attend a lot of meetings. Um, and I design signage and wayfinding. Um, but I also spend a lot of time mentoring younger designers in my office, uh, part of you know, different AIGA mentorship programs and try to give back to, uh, to younger designers and to help mentor them as they move along in their design careers. Um, but I think most importantly, the way that I do that is I ask questions of people um, and it allows me to have a better understanding of where they're coming from so that I can provide the best input and best feedback for them as they continue on their journeys. Um, so where have I designed? Um, right now, I design in my house. Uh, this is where I do most of my work as we're all uh, staying at home during this last year and a few months. Um, but I also design where our clients are. The majority of the projects that I work on are in the built environment. And uh, we don't design in a vacuum. We design for the context of where the final pieces are gonna be. And so uh, you can't design something while sitting in your house or sitting in your office for another location without having been able to either physically go there or to have enough context from floor plans and renderings and spaces so that you can understand the context of where your projects are gonna be. This could be living on a website where you see it on your phone or on a laptop or on an iMac or on a large screen, um, or it could be a printed book that you see on a display case at a bookstore. Um, and so always thinking about that final situation of where your project is gonna be, is gonna be really important throughout your whole career. Um, I started 
my kind of design journey at the communicator and the communicator was my high school newspaper. Um, I was the design editor my senior year. And this is where I kind of got a, my initial love for typography. I spent a lot of time working on this and uh, it kind of launched me into uh, studying graphic design in college at Western Michigan University. Now I hadn't taken any art classes in high school, hadn't really done anything like that. And I got thrown, thrown into art school. I wanted to be a designer. I had to go to art school and this is kind of how it worked. Um, so while I was there, I got, I had a, you know, a great set of classmates and professors um, and had the opportunity to design some things for the school for this uh, sculpture tour brochure, um, a literary journal that got put out every year um, and some class projects as well, uh, book design uh, in particular here, uh, thinking a lot about textures things, and how people kind of interact with the book. The one on the right is all about feeling things and seeing the different textures that you can create out of paper. Um, and then I went to the Basel School of Design for an intensive summer program uh, in between two of my years of school, um, where we did a lot in a short amount of time. Um, this is really where I started to get an understanding that any particular item can be transformed. Uh, you can draw it and you can design it in a multitude of ways. The images all on the left you see are all created out of a single square piece of paper, except for the very bottom right one, where you have a bunch of them together to create a series. And so this is where I started to really get an understanding that a single form can take a lot of uh, different applications and you can turn it into a lot of different things. Uh, in the middle column there, you see drawings of rocks. We drew rocks for three days. Um, and it's amazing what you can see after you've drawn a rock already for eight hours and you start back on it the next morning, you start to find new ways that you can appreciate those kinds of things. Um, and when I finished that program, I went there with a good friend of mine and we wanted to kind of commemorate what we learned and kind of the impact that I had on our, on our lives and on our education. And so we set out to create a kind of self, uh, a self-reflective project of our time there in Switzerland um, that we could bring back and kind of show our peers what we learned and try to pass along some of that information. So we created a whole poster series. Um, and it was the first time that I really figured out how to push myself past an initial idea and to really study a specific idea over and over and over. These are the final pieces, but many iterations led up to what we showed in the little gallery exhibit that we had. Um, when I finished school, I moved out to New York City um, and I got a job at Spagnola and Associates. Spagnola and Associates is a small design firm. At the time, it was me, one of the designer and my boss. So there were three of us. And this is where I really got drilled into the idea that good design lasts. And this is a wall that we designed in our own offices um, to keep that in our minds the whole time. We created this wall out of, I think it was 2008 pencils. Um, because the pencil is the tool that we use on a daily basis to create what we create as designers. So it became kind of inspiration for ourselves on all of our own projects. Um, I designed branding for Jib Oil, which is a um, gas company in Gibraltar, uh, which, you know, when I was in school, I never thought I'd be working on something in Gibraltar, uh, kind of right between Europe and Africa. Um, and after we did the system, we found out, yeah, it got put on a whole gas station. <laughs> uh, and you never really, think that something like that's gonna happen all of a sudden you see it, see some of your work all the way across the world. Um, and this is where I started working on exhibits and really kind of getting into this three-dimensional space. This was a corporate exhibit that we designed for Monsanto in St. Louis. Um, this is really when we started to uh, have to think about what the different people 
needed to find out when they came to this uh, exhibit in the headquarters here. So when somebody's visiting, it's why are they visiting? What are they gonna be doing when they're there? And what information do we want them to be leaving with? And if we don't have that kind of information that we can glean from the client through conversations, we're never gonna be able to make a good experience for the visitors when they show up. Um, and this is a, uh, a part of a kind of an exhibit, an entry wall for Cummins engines in uh, Indiana. Um, this was kind of a, one of my first forays into understanding how far you can push something and where you wanna take it. They, Cummins makes engines for cars and trucks. And we wanted to display those, but we wanted to rip them apart and take all of the different pieces. And so then it started to become, how can we um, cut these pieces apart and make them all kind of one unifying thing that also displays the, all of the words and values of the business, dependability, productivity, responsibility, something that when any employee comes into the space or any visitor comes into the space, they can see what they're doing there, why they're doing it, and they can be proud of the company that they're working for and the work that they're doing. Um, I also, what I do is I design on the side. Um, my brother is a jazz saxophonist and whatever he has a new album, I design the artwork for it. So as you can see here, just looking at kind of four albums from the last few years, um, there is no real style to it. The, ideas of the albums, uh, of the music help guide the, uh, help guide the designs. So every time I do one of these, I sit down with the band that he's working with and I have them tell me what the music is about, what they were thinking about when they were making it and what the purpose was of it. And that helps guide exactly what the designs are going to look like. Um, and most recently, for the last eight years or so, I've been designing at GHD Partners. Um, we design a lot of workplace branding and wayfinding, um, as well as print works and web work. We are kind of a multidisciplinary graphic design studio. Um, a lot of times when people think about graphic design, they think about printed pieces and logos and websites. Um, but it really does expand into this world of environmental and experiential graphic design, uh, which becomes kind of an all-encompassing thing in the built environment. So this is uh, when I started getting into this, this is when I really started to take to heart uh, what Charles and Ray Eames always said, which is that a good designer can design anything. You know, we design big walls, we design small signs, we design sculptures that get put into the middle of the spaces. Um, and everything that we do has a meaning and a purpose behind it. Uh, on the very left side here, the pattern that kind of looks um, a little bit like a flower um, is, this is in the Google offices in New York City in Chelsea Market. And Chelsea Market was originally a Nabisco factory. And they wanted to kind of bring in some of the history of the building so that they could inform their employees about what used to happen in the space that they occupy in there and every single day. Um, and that pattern on the top of that, uh, glass there is an abstraction at the top of an Oreo cookie because that's where the Oreo cookie was invented in Chelsea Market. So there becomes these kind of little Easter eggs and inclinations of ideas um, that will keep people informed and intrigued with the space that they're living in so or working in so that it will last for a long time. It brings you back to the idea of good design lasts. You want something that becomes kind of abstract and ambiguous. This is uh, some conference room privacy graphics that we did for the Business Insider offices in Manhattan. And this is an infographic on the glass. We have a plaque on the inside of the conference room that explains exactly what it is. Uh, but this is specifically referencing a video that they created and published on their site. This may be talking about rainbow bagels. I don't remember exactly. No, I can see it on the room side. The Blue Lagoon, I think it's in Hawaii. This is about uh, a rafting ride, I think, down a river. And every single square represents, uh, I believe, 500 views of the video. And the waves of it uh, represent 
at what point in time while they were watching the video did they click on the links to take them to more information so it is created entirely with content from the client it's proprietary information it can only be created for them and so we asked them a lot of questions we said what information do you want your employees to understand and what's important to you as a company and let's feature that in your office but make it abstract and ambiguous so that it still fits who your company is not just tomorrow and not just next week but in two years three years four years five years so that it doesn't become dated it doesn't you don't look at it and say that looks like we did that you know seven years ago we wanted to stay fresh for a long time have longevity to it um, another graphic for that same office space um, but we also get to design, you know, three-dimensional interactive pieces. Uh, this is a periodic table. You can go up and you can spin the blocks. You can learn about each one of the elements and you can make patterns out of the different colors and just kind of have fun with it. But it, again, provides people with the opportunity to learn more if they want to, but if they don't want to, it's a fun installation in the office that they're working in. And hopefully that they hopefully they can appreciate it and it brings some color to the space that they work in. Um, but we also have, do a lot of work with uh, some corporate real estate clients in New York City, um, and this is a very different kind of approach um, to design work than say a workplace project. Um, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to just draw attention. The real estate uh, market is just a matter of trying to get people to remember the buildings uh, and for them to remember the location of it. A lot of times the um, tenants that might move into the space um, might look at 50 different offices before they decide on an office to lease. And so how do you create something that is gonna be engaging and memorable to them that will stand out from everything else? And so we have these conversations with the clients about what is nearby the space? What does your building offer that is different than all of the other buildings in the surrounding space? And why should somebody come specifically to rent an office in your building? Um, and so we created a whole showroom for them. Um, and you come in off the elevator and right off the bat, you see this wheat field in the middle of Manhattan. Um, just because it's something that will make this memorable and different from another building that they went to. Um, so we created all these kind of unique installations trying to keep everything clean. Um, but we also got to design a table for it and just keep everything really nice and consistent and try to make a memorable experience for the people that are going there. And to go along with that, we design print books, brochures, uh, advertising campaigns, uh, kind of all different things that stay consistent and keep the message uh, that the client's looking for to market their spaces. Um, and we also do branding. So this is May Mobility. They are a um, autonomous vehicle company based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so they came to us right when they kind of started their, uh, started the business and they said, we have this new business, we are making uh, driverless cars, autonomous vehicles, and we need a logo and we want it to be different from the other companies that we see uh, that, that are doing similar things to us. They saw, and we said, well, what are you seeing? And what do you, how do you want to be different than the other autonomous vehicle companies? And they said, well, most of these, most of these companies are trying to be friendly and they're trying to be maybe a little bit childish because they want people to think that it's a approachable, um, an approachable vehicle and that it, it feels like something that you want to do. They're like, we want to be dependable. We want to be kind of rigid and we want to be clean. And we want to be environmentally friendly. We couldn't find a single, very, very few car companies using green. We were like, you're going to use all electric vehicles. We're going to go green. We're going to create a nice systematic rigid logo for you, create some brand standards. And then you're going to get your vehicles on the street and it's going to become an identifiable thing that will last for them for a long time. Um, and 
this is a space we did for the Truth Initiative, which is a nonprofit based out of Washington, D.C., who they work to end tobacco use in teenagers and young adults. And they were, they came to us and we said, well, why do you want graphics in your office space? Like, what are you trying to do? Uh, why do you need them? And they said, well, we're in an old office right now. We're building a new office and we're having a hard time attracting talent because people coming out of school want to go to a place that has a nice office and doesn't look like it's a it's an old place from the 90s with Venetian blinds. So like we want to bring in some of the youth culture. We want it to be bright. We want it to be open. We want it to be fun. We want it to be transparent. And so we came in, we designed um, some nice, big, open and transparent graphics, bring some fun to the space based off of their logo, uh, which was made up of a bunch of circles. And so it was, uh, it was a great experience. Um, brings us, this brings us to when, when do I design? I design from eight to 5.30 uh, generally uh, right now, but also, um, I design other things on the side. The two things on the bottom of those clocks are uh, things that I make every once in a while. I call them amoeba clocks. Um, so always kind of looking for new ideas. I design between meetings and I design when an idea is formulating in my head. A lot of times I sit back and kind of just think about a project for a long time, even before I put, put a pen or pencil to paper um, and I, create a few ideas in my head and kind of work through them that way. But I think everybody has their own process about how, how that works for them. Um, that brings me to why. Why do I do what I want to do? I do it to make experiences better for people, uh, to make a living, to rid the world of visual pollution, to solve our clients' problems. I think this is, this is a really big one. We're designers and we're not artists. Um, and this is kind of a uh, ongoing conversation that happens with everybody. And I, I've always kind of seen the difference between art and design as art being something that you kind of do out of self-expression and design is something that you do to solve a problem. And you're not doing your job if you're not asking the questions and solving the problem as the client needs it to be solved. Uh, but I also do it because I enjoy it and because it's challenging. Um, and how do I do what I do? By using my hands, by using the computer, by thinking, and by empathizing. So now we're gonna kind of rewind and look at these questions from a few new perspectives here. So we're gonna talk about applying for a job and about receiving applications. So you all, I presume most of you are students. And so you're kind of on the front end of that. And I've applied for many jobs in my career, but I'm also at a point now in my career where I'm receiving applications and reviewing applications uh, for positions at GHD. So while we're going through this next section, I would encourage everybody to think about a company that you have applied to recently or a couple of years ago, something that you were really interested in doing, um, or to think about a company that you would like to apply to maybe this summer, next year, but just keep in mind like who those people are. So we're gonna start with who. The first thing is how is kind of who you are. You're trying to introduce yourself to somebody else. Most of the time, as, uh, as we apply for jobs, it's usually kind of a cold email. You find a job posting and you try to fill out, fill out the application and provide the information that they're asking for in the application. Now, really the best possible scenario is if you have an in with that company, if you have some sort of connection to it, whether or not that's somebody that went to your college that works there, you might not know them, but you can at least write in an email I know that one of your employees went to CSU Long Beach and I'm very interested in working with you. There's a lot of different ways that you can create that connection, but unfortunately that is uh, kind of one of the best ways to get some direct contact with these people. But 
you generally are sending an email saying who you are. You're sending your resume. You're sending potentially a cover letter with that and a portfolio, a PDF or a website. Now, you have to keep in mind that this is the very first time that any of these people that you're sending this to are seeing you, seeing who you are. It's your very first impression. Um, and the very first thing that they see is what's in the email. It's not even what's attached to the email. The very first thing is the subject line and the body of the email. And so you wanna make a good first impression. And so you wanna think about how big is the company? And depending on how big it is, who do you think is reviewing those applications? Is there a HR team that might review it before it gets to a design director or an art director or creative director to review it for the design scenario? Or is it a creative director that is reviewing them off the bat? Are they a designer? Or are they not a designer? And think about who's going to be reading that and adjust your application based on, uh, you know, adjust your wording in your email to what you think might make you stand out a little bit more. Um, so I went back and pulled my application to GHD from a little bit over eight years ago, um, just to kind of give an example of, of what I've done in the past. And I by no means think that I did it 100% right. I, there's a few things in here that I wish that I would have done differently. Um, but what I did is I write a, wrote a short email that says who I was, where I was located, uh, how I found the job posting, the kinds of work that I was doing. And I attached a resume and a PDF with a few project samples and a link to my website. And I got a response to come in for a job interview. When I was in the interview, they said, we brought you in here because we just liked the way that your resume looked. Um, they were like, we knew we were going to interview just from the resume. I think one of the things that we see a lot is that people don't put a lot of time and effort into designing their resume, even though the resume is one of the very first impressions that people have. And you want to think about what the purpose of a resume is. The purpose of the resume is to show your education, your experience, um, and really just your name and contact information. That's about all you need on it. It doesn't need to be a big fancy thing. It just needs to be straightforward and to the point. Um, I had skills listed on mine and I would argue that you really don't need that anymore. You can tell what skills somebody has based on the portfolio that you're sending. Um, when I look at somebody, when somebody applies to GHD, I open up the email. If they wrote a short paragraph, that's great. I open up the resume. If I like the way that the resume looks as a graphic designer, then I'll go back and I'll read their full email, look at their portfolio and go about it that way. But if the, if the resume hasn't been thought about, we get too many applications uh, to filter through them all in that way. So that is kind of our first tipping point. So that brings us to the next question is what? What is the job? What makes you qualified for the job? Um, what will I be doing at the job? Um, does anybody have any thoughts about what the person on the other side, the person that's reviewing their applications, what they, what they might be looking for? Feel free to post anything in the chat. Um, you also want to ask, like, what makes yourself qualified? And if you're not qualified for the job, should you still apply for it? Um, so yeah, Tiffany says somebody who could work well with their team, absolutely. So they're looking for somebody that is, um, that does maybe similar kinds of work to them, or maybe they're looking specifically for somebody who does something different than what the rest of their team is already doing. Um, and so you can also see uh, what do they wanna see in an application? Um, Josh says somebody who will bring innovation. I think that's a great that's a great idea. So th then the question is, how do you show to them that you're going to bring innovation to their team? What are you going to bring that somebody else doesn't bring to that team? Um, and how can you get a, get that across in a short amount of time in an email, in a resume, and a short portfolio? Um, 
because your goal in applying for a job is to get an interview. You know, we, we put a job postings up and we publish our job postings and within two or three weeks, we get somewhere between 50 and 150 applicants. So we need some, you need something that will make you stand out and make you be, look different than everybody else that's coming through or just catch somebody's attention uh, while being professional and polite and yourself. So the next question is where? Where's the job? Where are you? Where would you be in the team? Now, this is a, when you're applying for a job, this is a relatively easy question, although right now during COVID, it doesn't really matter as much where you are since we're all working remotely. Um, but as we come out of COVID and as, as you all graduate and start applying for jobs, uh, one of the questions that comes up from the um, re application reviewer side is, where does the applicant live? Because if you're applying for a job, say in San Francisco, but you're in Los Angeles, there's gonna be a question of, well, if they wanna work in San Francisco, why aren't they already here? And are we gonna be responsible for making somebody move? Um, and maybe they don't like living in San Francisco, maybe that's not gonna work out. And so having a, um, being where you want to be and uh, in, the, in the place that you want is, can be important. Um, I've had, I know a number of people who, when I was in New York, wanted to get a job in New York. And I said, well, your first step to get a job in New York is to be in New York because you're gonna apply for a job and then they're gonna ask you to come in for an interview. And if you're not there, they're gonna interview somebody else. It's just another hurdle to get there. So what a lot of people did is they said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna put down a New York address in my resume. I'm gonna say I'm already there. But then, then you have the next step of, if they call you for an interview, you have to be able to get there whenever they want you to come in. So uh, it, does, uh, it does matter where you are. Um, and then the next thing is when. Uh, when does this job start? When should I apply? When would I start every day? Um, and from the other side, it's really kind of, when is the applicant available? Are they ready to start now? Um, do, they, do they live somewhere else and do they have to move here first? Uh, a lot of times design firms, when they post a job, they need help right away. Maybe it's because one of the, one of their employees left and they need to fill a position or they're expanding because they had a new project. And sometimes it's, if somebody has to move, they might not be able to start for six weeks. So, um, you know, there's just, sometimes sometimes you can start six weeks later. It's just kind of a case by case scenario and something that you just need to be aware of as you're going through this process. Um, then that brings you to why. So why this job? Why do, you, why do you want this job versus another job? And why should they hire me or Another question that you can ask yourself is why would they hire someone else instead of me? Um, and kind of from, from the other side of that is why this applicant? Like, why should we interview this person over another person? Um, can anybody think of any other why questions that the company side might be thinking about? We also have, you can kind of think about like why, you're gonna to wanna to ask why did somebody apply here? Because um, yeah, why is the applicant interested in Dallas? That's a very good question because a lot of times we even get applications from people that don't do anything remotely similar to what we've done and have not given any interest in, um, in the kind of work that we do in their application or their cover letter. Yeah, why do you want this job? Why do they want this job? Those are all good questions to keep in mind. You want to make sure that um, that they know why you want to work with them. Now, why did you want to leave your current job? That's a good question. That will likely come up if you're currently employed and you go in for an interview. Somebody can say, oh, why are you looking for a new job? What is it that you're looking for in your new role? Um, and 
if you have answers for those things and you can supply those answers to the review of your application, you're going to have a much better chance of getting an interview and starting along in that process. So we're going to take a quick uh, little sidebar here. Um, and we're going to go through a couple application examples. So I have um, taken out people's names from these, uh, but I've taken a few applications that we've gotten over the last couple of years. Um, and I'm hoping that as I kind of read through this and you guys read through this, you guys can po post in the chat something that you think, based on what you know about me, about the work that I've shown you today, about who GHD is, tell me what you think that somebody could have done a little bit better in their application. So subject line of the email, GHD partners, junior graphic designer, position inquiry. Hi, nice to meet you. Hope this email finds you well. My name is, and I'm a Brooklyn-based designer. I'm reaching out to express my interest in graphic design position at GHD Partners. I was recently working with Tushy as a junior graphic designer where I worked mostly on digital design, emails, email flows, ad campaigns, and simple web design, as well as packaging design. While my passion is working with typography, any related, anything related to print and editorial design, I'm also proficient in motion design, After Effects. My portfolio website is here where I showcase my projects from my recent experiences. I've also attached my resume and some of my work for reference. It'd be great if we could chat some time to learn about each other and further understand what I can bring to GHD partners. Thanks so much. Hope to be considered to be part of your team. And they attach their portfolio and resume. Does anybody have any ideas about something that this person maybe could have done better applying for a job at GHD? Yeah, good. Dad said, good question. What about environmental graphic design? Maybe they should show some interest in that. I agree. What this applicant is saying that they have done and what they like to design, email, digital, motion design, none of those are really things that you're going to see on our website. We might do a little bit of that, but it is not our primary focus. Um, Tiffany says, maybe show less of what's already on the resume and show more enthusiasm. Yeah, I think I'm going to see exactly where they were already working. I'm going to see the work that they've done for in digital design in their portfolio. So saying kind of what they're interested in and really why they want to join our team would go a long way. Here's another one. Environmental graphic designer application 328.18. To whom it may concern. I'm applying for the environmental graphic designer position posted on your website. I believe my qualifications and experiences, as well as my passion and energy for exceptional design are in line with your company's requirements. Please find my cover letter, resume, and digital portfolio attached, and let me know if you can provide if, if I can provide you with any further information. I look forward to the prospect of further discussing my qualifications for this position. Thank you. Any thoughts here? I do think that this is a, yeah, straight to the point from Ty. I think this is a um, relatively well-written email. It's professional. I think CJ says feel, feels cold and unenthusiastic. Um, yeah, why should we contact you further for further info? So, you know, what you're seeing here is a piece of it. You're not seeing their, their portfolio and resumes because uh, of, privacy issues with that. Um, but yes, it could have gone to any EGD firm. They don't mention GHD in this email at all. This could have been a template that they copy and pasted to any other, uh, to any other company. So something to keep in mind to make it personal and reflective of the company that you're applying to. Here's another one. Subject, first, last, West, Western Michigan University. Email, I was informed of this opportunity by my professor. Attachments, portfolio, and resume. <laughs> There's a thousand things that you could do better here. As far as I was concerned, this is one of the worst applications that I'd ever seen. And it's from, from the school where I, would, where I went. And the thing is, this is one example. We get applications like this all the time. <laughs> Maybe with another sentence. 
people don't even write anything in the email. They might write two sentences. Um, you know, sometimes people attach a cover letter as a PDF as well. And they think, okay, well, I wrote a cover letter. Here's the PDF. I don't need to put anything in the body of the email. But that's the first, um, it's the very first thing that people see. And if you leave that totally blank, your first impression is gone. You've lost it and you need to, uh, you need to try to make it up for it another way. And it's probably too hard to overcome. Was her portfolio at least good? Her portfolio was fine. <laughs> um, so here's another one. Um, subject graphic designer. Hey there, my name is blank. I just graduated from Columbus College of Art and Design and I'm following my dreams of moving to New York. I will be officially in the city July 20th, 2020. That being said, I'd love to make this a permanent move or permanent thing. I'm confident I would be a great addition to your team for the re these reasons. I spent the last four years with a focus study in advertising and graphic design, where I was able to become proficient in multiple Adobe programs. Through my various work opportunities, I've been able to work on and complete projects that match exactly what your team is looking for. I am adaptable and always eager to learn. I stay up to date with design trends. I am passionate, and most importantly, I've got the heart of a Midwestern boy. I would bring a lot of talent to this brand team, as well as many good laughs. Uh, I truly do hope you consider me for this position. Attachments, resume, letter of recommendation, and cover letter. Any thoughts about this one? About what, say, I might be looking for on the other side of this? Kimmy likes it, shows a lot of interest. We don't need to restate what's hopefully in their portfolio. I do agree that it's, it's a good introduction to their personality. However, there's nothing about GHD in here. It doesn't say that they're applying to us because they like any specific project. They're also, they're talking about proficiency in programs. Um, as a employer, I'm less interested in what programs you know how to do, but more about how you think and what you're, what, how you like to design. Just because you know how to use a program doesn't mean that you know how to design something. Somebody can know how to use After Effects, but if their animations don't look good, then that doesn't really help help you either. So um, having a little having this personal touch is good, but um, making sure that you're tailoring it to the place that you're applying to is also going to be helpful. <laughs> they did slip the Midwestern point, but it's probably just a lucky coincidence. So agreed, Deb. Um, and here's one more, uh, experiential graphic design open positions. Hello, hope this email finds you well. I'm reaching out in regards to the open positions for experiential graphic design at JC Partners. My background in experiential design ranges from clients in tech for workplace and branding to public and governmental entities for wayfinding and signage. My passion truly lies in making inclusive and accessible experiences for all users in the built environment and digital environments. Though most of my work has lived within the built environments, I've lately been pushing myself to more digital applications, and I'm currently learning new programs such as Figma and Blender in my downtime. Attached is my resume and my website is blank. Thank you again for your time and consideration and hope to chat in the near future. And then they attach the resume. Any thoughts about this one? portfolio question mark. So that's a good question. I personally, and this is speaking for myself and not for everybody reviewing applications, I don't particularly mind if they only send a website and don't attach a portfolio. Um, I think the key thing to think about is if they go and look at your website, you're not curating what they're seeing necessarily first if you have a landing page that has a bunch of projects on it. The goal of your application in these emails is to get the person to be interested in enough to bring you in for an interview. Um, and when then when you get in for an interview, you can bring more information, more projects to that so that you have more things to talk to them about than what you've already, what they've already seen. Um, yeah, Janice says they did make some connection to what GHD works on. I agree. I think that was very well done. 
all business, no real attention grabbers or standouts who did a jo good job expressing interest about GHD. So I don't, I agree, um, but there is um, a level of professionalism and a level of kind of exactness to what we're looking for. They hit all the boxes for what, uh, for what we do and they're succinct and they get to the point and they did have a good portfolio. Um, and Callum says, I like that they framed the learning new tools in their free time. I agree. I, I love that it shows that they're not only interested in the things that they already know, they're not relying on the things that they've already done, but they're interested in continuing to learn. Um, as you start to apply for jobs and move out into the, uh, you know, into your career, you want to find a place to work where you can continue to learn. When you leave school, you still have a lot left to learn. I'm still learning plenty of things every day. And so having, showing interest and showing that you are continuing your education is really important as you apply for jobs. So we're gonna rewind one more time here and we're gonna look at these questions from one more perspective. Um, managing and or being a team member on any design project. So I'm gonna ask all of you to kind of think about one of your projects that you've worked on recently and kind of reflect back on it and think about whether or not asking any of these questions would have made for a better project process or for a better project outcome. So the first thing is who? Who is the client? Who is the decision maker? Who's in charge? Who are we collaborating with? Who's doing what piece of the project? Who is our team? Who needs to review something before we send it to the client? Um, for any of your kind of any of your school projects, I'm sure you guys have done some. Uh, well, I know you did the the uh, competition that the winners were announced of, and that was in a that was a group project. So, any questions that could have been asked, who questions that could have been asked during any of those projects that would have better defined the process or the outcome from the onset. That's all right. I'll move on and just give you a little bit of an example from one of my projects. This is a, a few graphics that we designed for the Discovery Channel's offices in New York City. Um, we started this pro project. We worked on it for probably about two and a half years um, before they uh, moved into this building, uh, which they're just kind of starting to occupy now. Um, we started the project and we had a client team that we were presenting to. And we, th we thought from the beginning, great, we have this client team. It's the people from their brand team. They're making these decisions. Um, it's a large team who is making the decisions, which was a little bit complicated because you have to get a lot of people to have buy-in. Uh, and we were six or seven presentations in pretty, pretty far into the project. And all of a sudden they said, oh, well, we can't move on any further until you guys present this whole idea to one of the vice presidents at Discovery. And we said, well, who's that? And why didn't this come up previously? You know, we've been, we thought we were presenting to the decision makers. All of a sudden we had to rewind back up and create a new presentation that showed our whole process of how we got from our first presentation to our sixth or seventh presentation so then it just showed to one person because it turns out that the people that we were talking to were not the decision makers um, and that there was actually one other person that needed to say yes before we could do it. And that just causes more problems throughout, throughout the entire process and makes double work for us. If we knew from the beginning, we could have said, okay, great, let's get him in on the second presentation and on the fifth presentation and had him there uh, throughout the process, instead of waiting until we're too far in, it, it did cause us to backtrack and redo a significant amount of our work. Um, so the next question is what? What is the point of the project? Um, what does the client actually need versus what does the client think the project is? So I think this is a really important one as everybody 
uh, starts to uh, move into their careers. A lot of times you'll get, uh, you might get an assignment say, okay, we're designing a book or you're designing a coffee table. And the question is, well, what is it that somebody wants out of this? And is the thing that they think they want actually what they need to solve their problem? Or have they not taken the time to think about this in a kind of design process to make something or to think about what they actually need out of this project? Anybody have any thoughts about any other what questions or something that could have helped them in one of their recent projects? I'll show an example of this as well. Um, this is a few spreads from yeah, what roadblocks from Dallas? That's a good question. What, what are you going to run into in a couple of weeks when you're already partway into the project that's going to cause you problems? If you can try to forecast what some of those things are, you can design to those uh, roadblocks and get past them instead of designing up until you hit it and then having to backtrack and, and, and kind of go around those roadblocks. And if you already can identify what some of those things might be, then you're gonna be ahead of the game. So this is a project we just recently completed for ClearBridge Investments, and they kind of focus on environmental, sustainable, and governments investing. Um, we didn't really know anything about investing when we started this project, and they, they kind of came to us and they said, okay, uh, we want some help with this impact report that we're doing, but the person that we were talking to said, we really want to shift this to be mostly online. And then like, maybe we're going to have a, um, like a printed brochure that gives you a little bit of the information, um, but mostly it's going to live on a website. And so we said, okay, well, let's sit down and let's have a whole conversation. But first of all, I need to know who the decision makers are on this project. So we asked who, and they said, okay, yes, we need to sit down and we have, we have to have a meeting with three people instead of just the one person that we were talking to because they're the decision makers. We get those people in the room and we said, this is what we believe the project is based on what our first contact told us. And the top decision maker said, that's not what we want. What we want is actually about a hundred page printed book and then a small thing on the website that can, where you could download a PDF of it, but that just gives you a little bit of information. So all of a sudden, before we even started the project, we totally switched courses from a digital application to a printed application, um, just by asking the questions. So that brings me to where. Um, where is the project? Where is the target audience going to experience the project? Um, where are we getting the inspiration for the project? Are we getting inspiration from a diverse enough set of sources? Or are we getting our inspiration from a singular source? Um, where is the client coming from with this? Um, where are the clients? Um, are all the clients in the same place? Are they in multiple offices? And are they going to agree on those things? Um, anybody have any any other where questions that they would think about in one of these projects? Where are you going to source project materials? That's a great one, Tiffany. You have to you think about where you're going to source them. That has to also that brings you to another question. What once you start implementing these ideas of asking these questions, you find that one question leads to another question. Where are you going to source project materials? Will then bring you to what is the budget of the project? Um, do we need to purchase raw material? Do we need to purchase stock photography? Do we need to purchase um, new tools that we haven't used before? And has there been a budget defined to do that? Um, because not only are we just trying to design the best thing, but design is a business and it needs to work for the company. Um, where to start? Where are the pain points? Yeah, where to start is a great one because you can start a design project in a thousand different ways and in a thousand different locations and ideas. And if you're, say you're working on a, um, on a branding project, you could start immediately with the logo or you could start with a, um, a whole color study or you're gonna start with an audit of existing companies that are their competition. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you 
places where you can start um, and where are the pain points? What are you going to run into from those clients? Uh, where are they going to have the most issues? Where are multiple clients going to disagree on one item? If you can start to identify some of those, and it's, it's not like by straight up asking the client, where are the pain points going to be in the project? You need to start to have a relationship with those people and with your own team to understand where those pain points are going to be. Because your pain points could be with your teammates um, and you need to learn how to work through those and have an open dialogue about those things as well. Um, an example of where from some of my work is also, where are these going to be? Uh, this is a wayfinding system that we designed for General Motors outside of Detroit. Um, and working with the architects, the um, a really major question is where are these signs going to be and where are we direct be directing people to? And not only where are they going to be, but how do they then align with the architecture? We want to create a visual datum line across the soffits and the doorways. And we want to align our floor maps with their building maps. And we want to direct people specifically to where they're going when they need the information at a specific decision point. So where is a very important question for us, especially in wayfinding projects. Um, that brings us to when. When are we working on this project? When are the deadlines? When's our next critique? Um, anybody else have any thoughts on when questions? Or any other or any other when questions? When can we get a PO? When can we get a purchase order is a very good question. We're not going to work unless we can get paid. <laughs> how long are you planning to use this design? Excellent, excellent how question. Uh, because if you have something that is only going to be used for a month or for six months or for a year, you're going to think about your design process in a different way. Yeah, when to ask questions. When are you asking questions of yourself? When are you asking questions of your clients? When are you asking questions as a team? All of those are great. Um, an example of when, this was from the Business Insider offices in New York. They wanted to put up a timeline of the first 10 years of their business with all of the highlights, all of the milestones that they had. And we designed this project, right, I believe it was right at the very end of 2017. And they said to us, great, we're gonna put the timeline all the way up to 2017. And we're gonna include all the big milestones from this year. And we said, well, hold on, let's step back for a second and let's talk about when you want to add milestones. When you start adding milestones, something that you think was a really important thing in your business's development, and that happened last month, you are not far enough removed from that to fully understand whether or not that was a really major milestone for your business, something that you wanna celebrate on the wall. And so we talked to them for quite a bit of time and said, you need to think about when you wanna do this and you should not put anything up on your timeline until you're at least a year out from when that happened so that you can have a little bit of perspective of it and make sure that you're framing it in the best possible way for your business. Um, and that brings us to why. Um, why did we get this project? Uh, why is the client requesting this? Why are we behind schedule? Um, why is a very good question to uh, be self-reflective and to think about lessons learned and how you can improve things the next time around. Anybody have any other good why questions? Might have helped them in one of the projects, one of maybe one of their school projects. Why didn't we collaborate more? That's a great question. That you ask why we didn't collaborate more. Is it because you were in different places? Is it because one person didn't want to collaborate, or was it because one person did the whole project over a weekend and everyone felt like everyone else felt like they didn't need to do anything else? Or did somebody take the lead and not respect the other people's roles in the project? And once you ask that why question, then your next question, why didn't we collaborate more is how can we collaborate more next time? 
<laughs> Why didn't we ask more questions? Perfect question. Love it. Um, and so a why example, why did the intended narrative of the project not come through? That's a great lessons learned question. If it didn't come through the right way, even though you thought it was going to, take a step back and think about why it didn't work so you can make sure that that doesn't happen again the next time. Um, here as an example of why. Um, this is a wall we designed in the YouTube offices in New York. And they said to us, we would like a graphic on this wall that tells a story about who we are. And that when we have visitors come to the office, we can say, here's the thing about YouTube. And so that was the why. The why was, we want something that is a conversation starter. Doesn't need to be something that is uh, a really big statement or anything. It just needs to be a very good conversation piece. And so we thought about, what is video? Video is a series of still images, often at 30 frames a second. And so we went through a bunch of YouTube information and we, we found out that um, at the time that we designed this, there was roughly five hours of video uploaded to YouTube every single second. So we started thinking about 30 frames a second. So how many frames a second are we getting out of five hours of video? I don't remember exactly what, but it was somewhere around, it was multiple hundreds of thousands of frames. So that's what we did. We exported multiple hundreds of thousands of frames from five hours of famous YouTube videos. And we printed that entirely on the wall. And so all of a sudden YouTube could walk people through the space and they could say, that is one second of YouTube. Um, and it becomes a conversation that they can have for a long time. Um, so all of those things leave us with one more question. How? How do we do all of these things? Uh, how do we get the jobs that we want? How do we succeed once we get the jobs that we, that we get? How do we align our expectations in a collaborative team to make sure that everybody has the same expectations? If you don't have the same expectations, then one person working the project is going to have designed something totally different than another person. And design is a collaborative effort. Um, how do we manage client and internal expectations? Um, and we do that by asking questions and learning to empathize with people that are on the other side of the project. So that's the end of my questions. <laughs> conversation here. So now that brings us into questions from all of you. Thank you.